Hi everyone, welcome to the Outdoors with Hiking Bob podcast. I'm your host, Hiking Bob Falcone. You can find me on my website at hikingbob.com, which has links to my social media, my columns at the Colorado Springs Independent, all the other podcasts I've done, my social media accounts, my photography website, and also you can sign up for my newsletter or drop me a line. There's a contact me link there and you can drop me a line if you have a topic or a guest you'd like to have featured on here, uh, feel free to do so right there. And uh, as always, look forward to to your visit. Uh, You can also help support this podcast at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Hiking Bob and help support this podcast and help pay the bills. And you can get rewarded for doing that. So check out that also. So today we're doing something a little different for this podcast. Much of it was recorded on a hike in Fisher's Peak State Park, Colorado's newest state park down near Trinidad. The hike was led by Crystal Drayling, who is the manager of the park and a familiar name to regular listeners of this podcast. When I last interviewed her, she predicted that the trail to the top of the peak would be completed sometime this year in 2023. And this time around, we actually hiked to the summit of the peak and discuss what the hike will be like, when it will be done, and when visitors can realistically expect to do the hike. As a side note, we were doing this podcast outdoors, so there might be a little wind noise, but it shouldn't be objectionable. Please accept my apologies in advance. So we start the podcast on a backcountry road on the way to a trail. This is a road that's not going to be open to the public, and trust me, you do not want to try and get on this road. But it is a service road that's one of many of the old ranch roads in the park. And this is how we got to where the, basically I'll say we intercepted the trail that's going up to the peak. And, uh, well, we kind of tell a story about that right here. Hi, everybody. Hiking Bob here. Today I am in Fisher's Peak State Park, the newest state park. Regardless of anything else you may have heard, it is still actually the official newest state park. And I'm here with Crystal Drayling, who is the park manager here. It's been a frequent guest on the podcast. We've talked a lot about the projects we've done here in the park. And today we're going to talk about the progress of what's going on here. So, Crystal, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for being out here. Yeah, it's a good day. So we're on this kind of a back road. We're working our way up here. Uh, this is not necessarily a place where the public might get access to, but I'm looking here at the south face of Fisher's Peak. We're kind of way up there. And the big question everybody wants to know is, how soon is the trail going to open to the summit of Fisher's Peak? Give us, yeah. And I know we're still working on it, so I'm not going to hold you down to this <laughs> being exactly the date, but give us an idea when the park you know, trail might be open. Yes, thank you for your understanding in that because we have been working very hard on this trail and continue to work on this trail up to the summit of the peak. We are still um, hoping that we will have this trail open to the peak before the snow settles in. Okay. At this elevation, of course, here at the peak, we're at a higher elevation than we are down at the highway. So a little over 9,600 feet on the top of the peak. So winter comes early here. But um, construction has been going at a good clip. Um, The conditions for construction have been great this summer and early fall. So we're still hopeful that we'll have some um, public access to the peak, you know, before the snow settles in, before winter really comes in here. Okay. And the big question, how long have I? Now, there are no, and I should start out by saying, you know, I've hiked the trails that have been open here. And when you start at the trailhead, you can either go straight up what they call the challenge trail, which is an old ranch road. It goes straight up. It's difficult. Yep. Or you can take a couple of loops that are easier, but they add some distance to it. But assuming the straight line uh-huh. to the top, roughly, and I know with trail construction still going on, this may change a little bit. How many miles? Yes, you're right. So we don't have an exact number of miles, but we're ballparking about eight miles one way from the parking lot using the shortest route, approximately eight miles up to the peak. So the shortest route is also the hardest route. Yep, it does have a pretty rough um, climb on the Challenge Hill section of the Fisher's Peak Trail. Um, it's a relatively short distance of that um, steeper slope overall compared to the rest of the hike. Um, But everything else, you know, to get up to the peak has been built, you know, designed and built very thoughtfully so that you're really not struggling up to get up to the peak. It should be, um, you know, it's going to be full of diversity, full of fantastic views. The, um, your, 
your surroundings are going to change. And so I think it's going to be a really interesting trail all the way up to the peak, but there will be that, that hard part if you choose to take that. Um, the other alternative that I would take to, to avoid the challenge hill from the trailhead would be the lower lone cub and then the upper lone cub. Um, it's not adding a whole bunch of miles, um, a little bit more than two miles there from the trailhead. Um, very pretty hike, well-built trails. But, but some people still love that Challenge Hill section. They hike it every day. Um, some people a couple times a day. So we really do see people enjoying that Challenge Hill section too. And the Lone, Bear, the lone Cub trails are a shorter loop than the Goldenrod Trail, which is one of the, on, if, if you're going up there, going left or going right. It's a little shorter of a loop. Yes, going the Goldenrod Trail. And right now it's only for hikers, but the Goldenrod Trail is about 4.7 miles. Right. Whereas, um, and it's going to take off at the same point that the lower Lone Cub is going to take off. And altogether, if you do the Lone Cub trails, then, I mean, I think it's something like two and a half or, or two and three quarter miles up to our hub there, which would be the top of Challenge Hill. And then from there, you'll get on the Fisher's Peak Trail, continuing on east to the peak. Okay. And we were talking earlier before we started recording that there's uh, peregrine falcons that nest in the area of the peak so it's going to be closed every year for a while so give us an idea what the seasonal closure is that's going to be yeah and to our knowledge there's been an active peregrine falcon nest on the peak or in the close vicinity of the peak since the 90s and so this is something we've known about from the beginning of our ownership and it's something that we um, protect very seriously and so the closure for um, this buffer around the peak will be from March 15th every year until the end of July, so July 31st. So as of August 1st, people will be able to hike past the closure that we've built um, in this trail system and get up to the peak. So would it be, and it would seem to me that this would be the case, would it be a reasonable thing to tell people who are expecting the hike up here that probably this year, right after it opens, when the snow starts to fly and the daylight gets short, probably wait till next August to come up here and do that because that's going to be the earliest time with favorable weather and daylight that you can and the closure that you can get up to the summit yeah that's what i would expect um you know if you're on a mountain bike you're going to be able to get to um closer to the peak faster Mm -hmm. if you're on foot in november it's probably going to be a struggle and certainly to get um, out and back right um with it with daylight that might be nearly impossible so i would say that you're right there okay just waiting for the wind to die down just a little bit and we talked you talked a little bit about bikes will you be able to take a bike all the way to the top we will not be able to take bikes all the way up to the top and mostly just because it becomes you know once we get close to the base of the peak it becomes really rugged we are building something like 200 stone steps just in this section from you know the peregrine closure up to the top of the peak so at that peregrine closure will be the dismount location for mountain bikes And from there, they'll have a few miles to hike up to the peak. Um, But again, mostly just because of the rugged nature of this. And the trail will become more of a single track um, as you get closer to the peak. So for people familiar with the Dixon Trail, for example, in Cheyenne Mountain State Park, you can bike and and take your horse so far that you have to tie up or lock up and then go to the rest of the way. That's going to be a similar situation here. Yeah, it sounds like it. But no equestrian use just yet? Not right now. Okay. You think you'll have the same thing, equestrian use to a certain point, and then... Uh, and I know we're talking in the future sometime, but you think that's something that may be in the plans? Um, I think that we'll have a similar situation, you know, for folks who are out here on the trails on horseback and who also want to get to the peak, we will have a closure um, or some sort of a stopping point for horses where, like you're saying, on the Dixon Trail, they can tie up their horses, um, go up to the peak and then come back down. I don't think it will be the same location, you know, where we're asking um mountain bikers to dismount um so they'll be coming in on a different trail but there will be that sort of dismount spot um that you're describing okay um well i think it's all i have for now we're going to keep going up a little bit further and eventually and the weather is really good today yep or she's promised me we're going to hike to the top of fisher's peak yeah it's a special day and then i'm going to take a boatload of pictures good and then um you're going to have to probably pull me down on there because I might not want to come down <laughs> off the top of that. But we're I don't get ever to do want that. to either. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Crystal, thank you. We'll talk to you again in a few minutes. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. After we stopped along the road and did that little piece, we drove a bit further, parked, and then walked a short distance to the trail and started our hike up to the summit. 
We pick up the interview on the trail as we try to describe what the view looks like. So, Crystal, we've hiked up the trail a little bit. Yes. We found a place we stopped. We intersected a trail that's coming up here. We've gone through a number of the stone steps that you mentioned are being built here. And you have a name for this section of the trail. Tell us what you call this section of the trail. Yeah, this section of the trail is called the Stone Guard okay. section. Um, and the reason we named it that is we have this feature that sits north of Fisher's Peak itself that, you know, through all of our years of, of scouting for trail and planning trail out here and now building it, we called this feature Old Stone Face. Um, but for the trails, <laughs> made it something a little bit more regal. <laughs> and uh, we called the Stone Guard. And hopefully when people are walking this section of the trail and look up, you'll see that it kind of jumps out at you. And um, we sort of see it as a, as a big, strong guardian to Fisher's Peak itself. And this is a audible, audio medium, but I'm trying to describe something visual, but it's a, it's a large outcropping sits straight up out of the, the mountain here. And if you're describing a face, it would have a very severe underbite. Yep. <laughs> so the jaw sticks out of it. And you kind of make out where an eye is. I can see what I think is an ear, although the ear is in front of the eye, so it's probably not a good one to describe. <laughs> but, um, so we passed through a number of stone steps, and they're looking out toward the toward the east there it just drops off and just empties out into the plains and you can probably see i don't know if you can see kansas from here we always say we can see kansas <laughs> from where we're at or anything but yeah. the views here are pretty nice i mean this is really been a good day and we were fortunate to have a, a perfect weather day to be out here yeah yeah and until we come around this you know this sort of north loop that gets us on the east side of the peak you're look your a lot of your vistas are to the west and okay. the sangres and the spanish peaks and um, Trinidad Lake down below in the city but then when we come around here on this trail system you get to look east and like you said it's as far as the eye can see there's not hardly any roads or highways or even houses and it really gives you an idea of how um, remote in some cases this area still is how undeveloped this part of the state is and at least for me it gives me that peace of mind that we still have some grand open spaces there's a lot of that out here. Yes. Uh, a lot of ranch land and farmland, all that going out to the east here. Cool. Well, let's go hike a little bit more. Well, let's go. After this, we continued on the trail, which became less defined since it was still under construction the further up we went. At one point, we ran out of trail, pretty much, and then had to bushwhack through scrub oak that was chest high in some places. So to get to the summit, we had to scramble through a rock crevice, which was pretty sketchy and a little dicey. And then the views really opened up. It's here we pick up the conversation. So, Crystal, we are on top of Fisher's Peak. Yes, we are. We are looking at this view, 360 to view. That is absolutely to die for. <laughs> Actually, the Spanish peaks look small from here. Yep. Um, we can see in the New Mexico. I swear we can see in the Kansas, but everybody on the front range says they can see the Kansas. So I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> So the last bunch of this, this hike, and we've only hiked about a mile and a half to right. get up here. We shortcut, you know, we drove up. It was pretty difficult. Even the part that was finished, and then there's part that's kind of finished, and there's a lot of it that's not finished, that just we bushwhacked. What, what do you envision this hike? Do you envision this as being a difficult hike for most people when they, when they venture to come up here when this finally opens? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say it's easy, um, but like we talked about on the way up, for me, it's much easier now that the trail is built. Right. So our process to to plan and get people up on this peak and to build those trails has been a long time coming. And for me, when I'm on these newly constructed trails, I feel like it's a lot easier. Right. But, um, you know, like you pointed out earlier, when people get to this point where they're going to make that last ascent up to the summit they've already hiked six and a half miles and so um, people are going to want to probably take their time watch their footing and enjoy the views as they come up here and the views are stunning i mean we're up here and except you know those ladybugs that are crawling all over us but <laughs> at least they take small bites and don't hurt anybody um, this view is gorgeous i'm looking at lake trinidad right behind you there and the spanish peaks Again, well, let's just talk about the timeline for this. We're looking at this hopefully opening by Thanksgiving. Hopefully by Thanksgiving, yes. And But realistically, for a very long hike to do in daylight hours, because this park is not open overnight, right. there's no backcountry camping, no camping at all. Right. Realistically, and then with a seasonal closure with peregrines nesting in here, 
see, realistically, we can tell people that the, their best shot at doing this would be next August. Right. right. Yep. Um, so August 1st is when the closure would come off and the, the, the first day that the folks could get up to the peak. Um, we'll still have trails open up to that Peregrine closure. So a little bit more um, than what is open currently to the public will be open. And, um, and then, like I said, we're also, our next step is to um, fine tune and then build some looping trails at the peregrine closure so that ultimately hopefully next summer people won't have to or at least by the end of next year people won't have to um hike and out and back to the peregrine closure during that closure they'll have a looping trail that goes back to the trailhead but yes um i think that it will be the more intrepid folks that will be able to get up here this year is my guess. Okay. The, uh, you know, this process with the park has always surprised me and we are not trying to drag this opening out any longer than we need to. But as you saw coming up, this is, this is rugged terrain and this is um, kind of slow going in some places to build. There was a lot of elevation gain in a very short period of time through a lot of switchbacks. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, I will call this, and you know, everybody's gonna, odd people disagree with me, but as an experienced hiker, I would call this a difficult trail, at least this last section we did. Getting to this part, to the closure, I think is probably not gonna be all that difficult. I've hiked some of that. Yeah. But I think when you get up to this last pitch to get up here after you've already done six and a half miles, it's going to be not for the faint of heart or for the uh, weak of uh, will, yeah. I guess would be the best way to put it. Yeah, and maybe that's something, you know, it's great conversation and, and good for people to have in mind um, to pace themselves and hydrate and go slowly as you're gaining this right. elevation because folks are gaining about 3,000 feet of elevation from the parking lot to where we are right now. And that's important for people to understand and remember when they're hiking up here. Because we want everybody, if you get up here, get up here safely and get back safely. Absolutely. Well, the views are, st are stunning. I think when people do come up here, they're just going to die when they see how great this view is. And yeah. they'll be in awe of it. Well, thanks a lot. We're going to hike back down. We are. Which should be an adventure all on its own. So <laughs> we're going to hike out of here. Thanks a lot for being on the show again. Yeah, thanks and for having me again. We, I love it. We may talk to you a little bit more when we get down there, or we may just be so tired we're going to go home. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> okay, we'll see how it goes. All right, thanks. Thanks, Bob. I wish I could describe in more detail what the view looked like from the summit. It is very big, and I'm guessing it might be almost 20 acres, but don't hold me to that. It's also relatively flat, so you can easily walk all the way around it. Although we chatted quite a bit after that last clip due to very high wind and a very bumpy and noisy ride down, it doesn't make for good audio, so I'll cover the highlights of it here. Even with this fastest park development is moving along, there are still years of work in the planning stages. The park, which stretches from just south of Trinidad all the way to the New Mexico border, is huge. Drayling has plans for almost 100 miles of trail, along with the visitor center, which she promises will have a great view of the peak along with campgrounds, both backcountry and full service, uh, also bike and equestrian skills courses. She envisions backcountry camping to be something like the shelters at Bar Camp on Pikes Peak, along with dispersed tent camping. So if you've kind of ever been to Bar Camp, even if you haven't parked it, uh, even if you haven't camped there, you know that there's the the cabin and then there's those little shelters around there. So she's envisioning something like that, which sounds like a pretty good idea. If you're wondering when or if dogs will be allowed in the park, well, that is subject to a wildlife management plan, which is not yet complete. The findings of that plan, which kind of helps to determine what kind of wildlife is in there and uh, uh, their viability, I guess would be the best way to put it. The findings of that plan will determine whether you'll be able to bring your favorite puppy into the park. Until then, however, no dogs, please. If I were a betting person, my guess would be that there will probably be dogs in there, but they may be limited to certain trails. However, that's just a guess. Do not hold me to that. More to come, of course, as things progress with the park. When the trail of the summit is open, bikes will be allowed about six miles up the trail, and we're assuming the most direct route straight up the Challenge Hill and up to there. And from there, you will have to hike the rest of the way. And again, that's similar to the situation in Cheyenne Mountain State Park on the Dixon Trail to the top of Cheyenne Mountain. The point where bikes won't be allowed is roughly the same point as where the seasonal, seasonal closure to protect the peregrine falcons will be. So 
when they close it for the season, the idea won't be that you won't be able to get your bikes up that far. At least that's, again, all of this is still in the planning stages, but I have no reason to think that's not going to happen. In short, while recreational opportunities will continue to expand at the park, it may be quite a while before the park is fully developed. As you probably guessed by now, a lot will depend on funding. Nothing happens without the dollars to pay for the work. As a side note, it's probably going to be millions of dollars worth of work. Remember, I can guarantee it's millions of dollars worth of work that still has to be done there. How many millions? I don't know. Not privy to that information. And of course, nothing stays the same price, so it could go up. In the meantime, I do and suggest that you explore the park as often as you can. I think you'll find an enjoyable experience. When I first reported on the park, there was very little there. I said I wouldn't make the special trip down there to see it, but if you were by passing it on the way to Albuquerque or Raton, New Mexico or someplace like that, it'd be worth a stop. I do now think that with the trails that have already been in place for about a year and the trail that a summit is definitely worth a special trip down there. It's a quick ride down I-25. It's about a 110-mile trip, but, you know, it's I-25. You go through it pretty quickly. And I think it's definitely worth making a special trip down there. Uh, and plus, I think if you go now, you get to enjoy um, seeing it as as it expands. If you go maybe every year and try new trails, I think you'll see it expand. Uh, I did a similar thing at Staunton State Park, the state park that was built just be, you know before this one. And I went there over the years, and I have different maps that show different trails and how it expanded and expanded and expanded and more opportunities came up. I think that's kind of a cool thing to do. So if you get a chance, um, you know, I would definitely recommend going down there. I would recommend going down there before winter sets in. They do get a lot of snow up there, but I do uh, think it's a good place for you to go. Before we go, I'd like to thank the uh, CPW public information officers who helped um, uh, make this podcast and all the podcasts I've done with people from CPW uh, happen. Appreciate their collaboration and their work and, and help me gain access so that I can share all this information with you. I'd also like to thank Crystal Drayling, the park manager. She took uh, time off, I believe. It was actually her day off when she was out there doing this with us, so I really appreciate that. She's always open to suggestions and comments and always open to do another uh, always open to doing another interview with me and I really appreciate that I know she's incredibly busy working on this new park and I appreciate her taking the time to do that and with that um, I'll say thanks for listening to the outdoors hiking Bob podcast talk to you next time